as we struggle every day with the computers, we begin to feel the immediate need for a little Zen philosophy or something of that nature to keep us in one piece. And I think that the most interesting ancient approach to the whole problem of modern intellectualism is that of Buddhism, which in turn derived most of its fundamentals from Hinduism. In the Hindu classics, there is the simple line, the mind is the slayer of the real. And through thousands of years of human experience, this has been more or less proven to be true. The mind is something that we do not understand, for there is no way apparently that we can grasp its proportions except by its own use. And it is a little bit like a dictator who gradually takes on control and command of every part of man's instruments of knowledge and growth. The mind must be considered, therefore, as a kind of machine. And Buddha called it the machine of the six sensory perceptions. Now, at his time, machinery must have been pretty primitive, but he still used this term, and he used it in a way that was quite authoritative. He meant definitely that the mind was an instrument. The mind is not the self. The mind does not speak for the self. The mind does not make infallible utterances. The mind is bound to a series of mechanical processes rather parallel to those of a computer. The mind has to take in certain information. This information is then classified and organized, and certain conclusions arise as to the relative values of the various fragments of, of understanding or experience or evidence that we find. There is no point, apparently, in the mental instrument in which it can transcend itself. Now, it is certainly true that if you buy a cheap computer, you're not going to get much. And if you live through life with a cheap mind, you're not going to do much better. <laughs> Fortunately, however, we can gain certain mental maturities. We can become a little more wise in thinking. We can discipline the machine. Just in, as the operator of a computer has to know what he's doing, has to study the problems of his instrument or else get into serious difficulties. So the same is true of the mind. We take it for granted, but it is not something that can safely be taken for granted. The mind is an instrument that has to be observed, that has to be worked with, that has to be enlightened as far as possible and must be always under the discipline of something superior to itself. There must be the operator, not only for the computer, but for the mind. And this is part of the oldest form of Indian philosophy, that there has to be something above the phenomenal existence to help us to create a way of life that can escape from mediocrity that we do not need to go on through life learning little, suffering much, and actually passing out of this environment very little ahead of what we were when we came in. Experience is important, but only if we understand it. All kinds of living gives us information if we know how to gather that information. We read books. Maybe they help. But without discrimination, reading can be a total loss. We go and travel to different parts of the world, and through the sensory perceptions we observe where we've been. But we can go completely around the world and come home without any basic understanding of humanity. All these problems go back to the machine of the sensory perceptions. And the principal perceptions, according to Buddhism, are five. 
what we call the five senses. And these are the gateways by means of which information goes in to the computer. Uh, these five channels, therefore, are constantly affecting each other and together affecting the conduct of the person to whom they belong. We can see all kinds of things, but if we do not see its value, then all is lost. We can have all opportunities for education, but if we simply decline to be educated, we can graduate with honors and still be ignorant. Because these values are either temporary, superficial, or earnest. And if these values are earnest, everything contributes to life. Now in Zen, all the testimonies of the sensory perceptions are simply filtered through a series of disciplines to come out with the final conclusion that the thing as it is, is right. Now the thing as it is may not be at all appealing to us, and we may spend our lives trying to avoid it or evade it. But the entire purpose of life is to discover the meaning of life, to find in all the evidence that pours in the gradual accumulation of a constructive integration of faculties. In other words, we must come to the point where we begin to understand the real values of daily experience. We must also come to the point where we can accept and work with our own shortcomings that we can discover what parts of our nature are undeveloped and therefore open to tragedy. We can do many, many things if we use the computer intelligently. But we have to realize that no matter how we use it, it deals with the external life of the person. The computer is the same thing as any other physical instrument. It has limitations. The tel telescope can look far out into space and give considerable information to the skilled astronomer, but the instrument itself can never understand that which it discovers. Something has to use it that is superior to itself. The one who uses a computer must be superior to the instrument in order to control and direct it. And the individual who has a mind must be superior to the intellect if he expects to have a constructive life. He cannot follow the mind. He must lead it. And the way to lead it, of course, has always been one of the great mysteries of life. Up to the present time, the only answer we have to the problem of leadership is that there is something superior to mind. Some have called it soul power. Others have called it spirit. Some have regarded it as a differentiation of deity. But there has to be something above the mind, or it will become a dictator. And as a dictator will spend the life of the individual fulfilling the mind's desires and trying to prove that the mind's desires are inevitable to the happiness of the person. As against this point of view, we realize that most people with good minds are in trouble. They are worried, they are frightened. In fact, they have many kinds of anxieties that comparatively undeveloped minds have not yet caught up to. In other words, if you are a simple person and have had practically no complication in living, you have certain direct simple values. You have a clear concept of right and wrong. But the mental coordinator will mix that concept so completely that you will end by simply doing what you felt like doing in the first place. There is no discipline in the mind. In fact, it leads us constantly into temptation. To use the mental coordinator, therefore, we have to recognize that a very large part of man's internal life is under the control of his external circumstances. While he lives in this world, in this material and physical plane of existence, material things become increasingly important to him. And this importance is reflected through the testimonies of the sensory perceptions. 
he finds that he enjoys wealth. He likes to have a palatial home. He wishes to outreach uh, his neighbors in elegance and, and uh, perhaps in, in temperance. These things are all mental attitudes, but they come back into the mind and reassert themselves, gradually tearing down the entire moral structure until nothing is important except wealth. And that is the condition that many people are in today and the large part of the world is suffering from. The mental coordinator of humanity in general, the level of the might be termed average individual, is largely dominated by physical considerations. That which is beyond the physical is beyond interest or beyond activity in our daily living. So on the basis of the physical, we take in all kinds of evidence. We take in all kinds of experiences. We find who our friends and our rivals are. We see what makes us sick and what helps to keep us well. All kinds of testimonies come in through these five sensory perceptions. Actually, if we used a little bit of thoughtfulness, we could gain experience from all of these things that happen to us. But largely, the mental coordinator interprets these things according to its own structure and pressure. Therefore, instead of a certain incident impelling us to recognize a personal defect, the mind will assist us to blame this incident on somebody else. The mind is forever protecting its own attitudes and interests because it has nothing else that it can do. Consequently, we cannot depend upon it transcending its own level. We have to work with it on the level in which it exists. Now, taking the problem of daily living, we realize that the five sensory perceptions are like five doorways or channels by which information from the outside goes into the mind, into the inner life of the person. These windows, therefore, are very important to us, and they must be kept clean. If the window glasses become overshadowed with dirt or soot, they can no longer bring us the proper viewpoint or give us the proper knowledge. And most of this uh, obscuring factor that distorts or obscures the glass will be prejudice and excessive opinionism and uh, excessive egoism. These things will cause the experience to be worthless before it even reaches the mind. It will be rejected totally by the person who says to himself, I have no defects. I'm here and I'm doing all I want to do and I'm a success. Therefore, when danger signals show up, this person rejects them. And even if they get through into the mind, the mental process itself must work with them. Now, when the mind starts operating on these problems, these five streams all flow in at once. Usually one or two are dominant at a time. But the thing seen is also perhaps the thing heard. Uh, the thing looked at may be the food that is tasted. All kinds of testimonies come from the sensory perceptions. And those, of course, most commonly used are sight and hearing. These become the basis of what we would call truth. Truth is what we see, for the thing seen must be real. Truth is the thing we hear, and because we hear it, and because it is pronounced by some exalted authority, we decide it must be true. Therefore, from the outside, hearing and seeing are the two greatest factors and the greatest thieves and robbers in the sensory gamut. In the first place, things seen as such have little or no meaning. It is the meaning of the thing seen. It is the interpretation of the symbol, which is the thing we see, and which must remind us that the truths of life, the values of life, and the very substance of life itself will always be invisible. Therefore, we can only see what it does, 
And the moment we see what it does, we begin to interpret it. And by the time we've interpreted it, we've taken the natural truth that it might have revealed entirely out of it. So the problem is to see straight, to see clearly, and to see honorably. These things require the development of a faculty of honesty in ourselves. We have to be willing to accept the unpleasant if it is true. We must be willing to blame ourselves if we are guilty. And we also have to be in a position to realize that a large percentage of our difficulties in life arise from our own conduct. If we can come this far, we will begin to influence the mental coordinator. For this mental coordinator also carries within it the function of memory. And the memory bank is one of the features of a computer. And memory, therefore, can revive at any time, at will, most of the important incidents of a person's life. And these incidents may have been passed over without any consideration of value when they occurred. But memory can bring them back as symbols which a more mature degree of our intellect can help to interpret. Therefore, out of the things that have happened in the past, much useful information can be gained if we overcome this sense of infallibility in which we cannot conceive of ourselves making mistakes. Now, we know we do, but we pass over it lightly. We do not wish to become entangled in the concept of judging ourselves when we are wrong. Now, into this computer, therefore, that we have here, the mind, we have these streams of evidence. Some of them are like the films in a motion picture theater. Some of them are highly symbolical. Some of them are trash. Many of them can be used in, for, in, a, for, in an important way. Others are just not for us. But these all have to be sifted out and combined with others, evidences, to bring a total picture from the mind of all of the aspects of a particular problem. If we are considering an apple, we must consider what it looks like, we must consider what it tastes like, the color, the texture, the aroma. We must consider all these things to get a full definition of what an apple looks like. Now, this process is instantaneous in the mind, but it is only there because faculties are brought in the evidence. If the evidence is contrary, then the judgment is wrong. If it should happen that the testimony did not notice that there was a worm in the apple, then the coordinator takes it on. It comes out with a verdict that is unrealistic. Therefore, everything has to depend upon the acceptance of the experiences of life. A constant receptivity uh, to the wonder of fact and truth, which are by far the most important values that we can cultivate. Now, as the information all goes into this memory bank situation, it can form a basis for dispositional decisions. The individual no longer thinks simply from the occasions of the moment. He doesn't like or dislike only on the occasions of the instant. He calls upon the record in this bank. He can bring back all the indications and recordings of what has ever happened to him. He can find definitely ways to perpetuate a grudge forever. He can also find the consequences of perpetuating it for a number of years and realize that it did no good. Therefore, out of the memory bank, we get symbols from the past that help us to integrate the present and build for the future. Life is one unbroken sequence, and when we begin to break it so completely into past, present, and future, we lose the value of the memory bank of the testimonies of things done and the substances of things hoped for. Therefore, the mind has to work together in all its faculties and parts. Now, one of the things that Zen uh, is, in, is concerned with is the problem of detaching the mind itself from the tremendous attachments that it has to phenomenal things which are, at best, impermanent. 
Zen would like to believe that the individual, through discipline, can restore the essential common sense which was his in the beginning, that he will no longer fall victim to a series, a series of false beliefs or doctrines. The fact that he reads a certain book and finds in it an opinion that seems to satisfy him at the moment is no proof that this opinion is true. The uh, Zen attitude is, in a sense, almost brutal in the fact that it has no place in it whatever for human self-deceit. The individual either faces reality or admits that he can't face them. So out of this facing of reality comes a simplification of life. The, a number of the Greek philosophers, including Diogenes and Socrates, were also the exponents of the simple life that the way to escape from problems is to have no ulterior motive in yourself when you contemplate the conduct of others. If you have a firm foundation of integrities, you will find integrity in everything that you see, whether you like it or not. The integrity may be a warning, it may be a reward, it may be a penalty, but it will be honorable, honest and inevitable. As soon as we begin to see some of these things, we stop fighting with ourselves. We stop blaming life for our misfortunes. We stop hating other people. And we begin to relax away from the most powerful of all physical factors, possession. The Zen man is not likely to be overly interested in possession. Nearly all of the sages of the East and most of the uh, monks of the West have been sworn to poverty. They do not want things because they know that things are among the most powerful forces to destroy character. That whatever the individual has, he must learn to use or he will abuse. Now, to transform an abuse to a use is a matter of understanding. It's a matter of calling upon the resources not only of the mind but of the heart to find out what was wrong and how it can be corrected. Actually also, in worldly things, the Mahayana school of Buddhism did not advocate a monastic life for everybody. The only individual who should take on a monastic life in Buddhist philosophy is the individual who doesn't need it. When he can get along perfectly well in this world, adjust himself nicely and easily to the problems of daily existence, has learned many good and useful lessons, and has brought his own conduct under the control of integrity, this individual is ready for a monastic life. But any individual who uses it to run away from trouble is just fooling himself. Because he, this is the result of a dominant, uh, aggressive, mental uh, interference with the proper course of life. So the uh, simple life is one in which the individual does not experience a sense of loss. He has decided by his own experience that uh, the things that he gathers are his losses and the things that he lets go of are his gains. This is something that philosophy helps him with. It doesn't follow that this person has to become indigent or has to do uh, without the common necessities of life. He may live within a reasonably comfortable, happy, pr prosperous pattern as long as possession does not dominate him. The moment possession comes first and integrity is compromised, the mental coordinator can bring in a whole pattern of difficulties that are going to follow. That is, if the person is looking or listening. If he is not, then the coordinator will probably bring in a series of excuses so that he can continue to make the same mistakes. It's a very tricky thing, this mind, and we have to work with it with a great deal of integrity. Perhaps it is the first thing we have to convert to religion. Now, most people believe that the body should be converted by baptism. But something has to uh, convert the mind. The mind has to be brought back to a high moral code. 
It must be disciplined into repentance for its own foolishness. It must be under the guidance of someone or something stronger than itself that is honorable in every sense of the word and also skilled in the use of the instrument. Thus we have the computer. The computer can do anything within a mechanical pattern, but it is useless, worthless, and vain if there isn't a human being operating it. Now we have to find in the confusion of life where the human being in ourselves is located and what power it has to determine our conduct. If we do not make this decision and this discovery, we will simply be in trouble for the rest of our lives. So behind the mind and beyond it, there must be the operator. There must be that power which is essentially the true value of life. Well, various mystics and philosophers and esotericists and metaphysicians of countless branches have taken this problem into serious consideration. And in the stream of Western mysticism particularly, the final version has been that the heart is the leader over the mind. The good heart can control the mind because it puts pressure upon value. Love is stronger than hate. Hate is a mental factor. Love is a spiritual one. The moment our hates increase, it's because the machine is grinding out all kinds of testimonies of what we have suffered. What other people have done to us, especially some one or two persons whom we will never be able to forget. The reason we will not be able to forget is because the mind continues to play the tune every day. The only answer to this then is to get an operator that can cancel out the influence of the mind or reduce it as far as possible. And this operator, which is in man, the center of his own life, is the heart. The heart, therefore, is not a an organ that receives all kinds of messages. It does, however, have the peculiar power which the mind does not have. The mind has to gather from the outside. The heart has to release from the inside. That which comes from the heart seems to come from the source of life. That which comes through the mind seems to come from the source of trouble. And the uh, two points of view are only reconcilable by a dedication or an, an interpretation of mystical experience. Actually, therefore, we may say that if the heart leads, the mind can be converted. The mind can gradually come to censoring its own attitudes. It can say that for 20 years this data has been fed in, that we don't like somebody. Now, by a moment of spiritual realization, we have forgiven them. Now, at that moment, uh, love or the soul has taken precedence over the mind. And when this occurs, the mind has to accept because the mind is lesser. The mind has to realize that if it wasn't for the heart, there wouldn't be any mind any more than there would be any physical brain unless the heart was constantly pumping life. So the leadership of the heart over the mind is something that we still have to learn in this world. For the heart is that which gives us the moral instruction and the ethical integrities necessary to use the mind constructively. Of course, most of the mystics have also discovered gradually that the need for the power of the intellect decreases to the measure that man's inner life unfolds and enlightens. The mind is not necessarily going to be a tempter forever. The mind can be of itself uh, circumscribed. It can be included within something bigger than itself. The moment the heart leads the mind, then the mind begins to see good in the testimonies of the sensory perceptions. And instead of the sensory perception coming in and saying, I'm going to have uh, alcoholic refreshments today, the... Uh, the heart says, no, not today, and the mind accepts it. 
It is necessary for the heart, however, to lead. And the problem, of course, is what way should the heart lead? Well, the heart has to lead a much more difficult pattern than the, the mind. The mind depends entirely upon physical things. It depends upon the observatories, the laboratories, all the research work that is being done in every field. It requires a long and specialized education in an, in an art or a science by which a proficiency is attained. But there is no art or science that we gain, no tremendous discovery that we make that transcends the inevitable dissolution of ourselves. In other words, whatever we have, we have to leave behind. Whatever information we have accumulated is going to be subject to re renovation and reformation. Already the Einstein theory is assailed on every hand. What we consider to be the great discovery of the moment is left behind and forgotten when new facts are discovered. So all this vast accumulation of material factors has, has very little essential enduring value. And in the process of getting there, the individual has allowed the better part of himself to become corrupted and corroded. In the search for fame, in the search for wealth, in the, in the desperate desire for public office, the individual betrays the heart and depends upon the schemes of the mind to fulfill his purposes. All these purposes are short-lived, and in a very short time, the mental coordinator and its activities uh, cease to be of value or significance. On the other hand, the heart seems to have a different kind of life. The heart, because it is directly connected with the source of physical life, has within itself a certain germ of immortality. It has the seed of spiritual integrities as part of its own existence. It is the most tenacious thing in the world of forms. It is a tremendously vital something living upon a force and a power which no scientist has ever been able to discover because all of life is invisible and that which in, is invisible cannot be discussed adequately in visible terms and certainly the invisible cannot be well recorded upon a computer because these things depend upon visual factors they depend upon a series of mechanical processes and behind all mechanical processes in life is a process that is transmechanical, above it, far, far beyond it. So the heart becoming, as we might say, the source of reality, begins to search for what we are all searching for in this world, and that is happiness. We would all like to be happy. But of course, as the Oriental mystic would say, in order to be happy, you must be right. There's no amount of wrong that can actually lead to an enduring happiness. Fulfillment of some selfish project brings a moment of thrill or excitement. But in a short time, the circumstances close in and the individual finds himself in trouble. So the problem always is to find out how we can do things without violating the laws of existence how we can transcend personal desire. Now, the, of course, most people find they can sacrifice their own personal happiness for some other cause. There are quite a few people that feel that way, and some do it. But for the majority, to go against the, the appetites of physical existence is a great hardship, a hardship that very few are interested in facing. To further complicate this point of view also is the, the end of life is itself invisible. After we depart from this mortal coil, uh, there, the physical factors cease and the computer has to stop because there is nothing more that it can register. But to, to many people, this mystery of what lies beyond is so abstract 
that the mind turns naturally to the addiction to things visible in this world. Therefore, we sacrifice the invisible unknown for the, sac for the fulfillment of visible known appetites and ambitions. There seems to be very little way of getting around this unless we again begin to develop the power of the heart and begin to see what it can do to make these things work better. Looking around the world as it is today and as it has always been, we cannot but realize that there is something wrong. And that something is wrong is the lack of natural affection. Nations do not like each other. Individuals live in a world of pressures and competitions. Country after country exploits other countries and invades them. War is in the air even while peace is being discussed. Everything in the physical world is in uproar. It is in an uproar due to the fact that just honest kindness has been lost. Now the... Uh, Buddhist philosophy uh, goes in on this in the introduction of the Lord Maitreya. The Lord Maitreya is believed in Buddhist philosophy to be the next great avatar, uh, the one who is to follow Gautama. And the great uh, uh, avatar Maitreya is in the Toshida heaven waiting to come down into mortality. This is the Prince of Peace. The word Maitreya simply means kindness. The word actually means that. Therefore, the idea of the personal deity is not the important circumstance. The only answer to the problems of life is kindness. When individuals are kindly and thoughtful, then the mind is used to support thoughtfulness and every factor that comes along is interpreted in the terms of how we can be more friendly, more kindly, more compassionate. This idea that the Prince of Peace, the one to come, the desire of all nations, is kindness, is not an abstraction. It is obviously the only answer, apart from dissolution. But the individual will accept this answer but he doesn't know what to do about it, and he doesn't know how he can hope that it will arise in this sorrow-torn globe on which we live. But the fact of the thing remains that the kindness factor is enthroned in the heart. And outside of kindness itself, there is really no solution to problems. Now, kindness can be exploited. Unkind people can turn upon a kindly one and make life very difficult. But the person who is basically kindly cannot actually be hurt by unkindness. We are hurt by unkindness because we are offended by it, because we believe it is unjust, because we sense that it is ulterior in its motivations. But in this process, we lose the kindness factor ourselves, and then the problem is really bad. So regardless of what others do to us, the wise person is kind and moderate at all times, searching forever to find the good and determined to build upon it. If he does this and turns his attention to society, he may be surprised on how much goodness he's going to find there. This is not the type of thing that we hear about. It's not the thing that makes the newspapers or the television programs. The good things people do are for some reason taken for granted. The bad things are dramatized. This seems to be the way of pointing out something. But most people do not get that kind of a reaction from it. They assume the rest of the world is like the individual who is delinquent on a television screen. So we go on down to what else can we do about some of these points, and we go back to the mental coordinator again. The mental coordinator, for example, is probably educated essentially by only one thing, and that is experience. The mental coordinator must derive its basic information from the things around it, 
because it can only depend upon the sensory perceptions for evidence. Therefore, if it is unprejudiced, open, kindly, and basic attitudes, it can and will gain a great deal from the contemplation of environment. If it is cruel and unkind and selfish and self-centered and arrogant, it will still learn a great deal from the conditions around it because it will ultimately see all these things fail and those who are participating in them come to grief. But the uh, individual who is not honest is not looking for these integrities. He is denying them and clinging desperately to the iniquities. Actually, therefore, the experience factor is important to the mental coordinator. The five sensory perceptions are brought together under a sixth collective unit, which is called the coordinator. In this, all these things are mixed together to form perhaps a brew like the witches of Macbeth brewed in their iron pot. But uh, also, out of all this conflict, there comes an ordering factor. We have a series of faculties in the brain to which these various pressures are assigned and by which the various elements of character are built up. Wherever something good is found, it strengthens the faculty of that character. Therefore, if we find a generous person, a certain part of ourselves is given a lesson in generosity and it will stay if the individual is mindful to keep it alive. If, however, generosity is regarded as a vice, then it will be forgotten as quickly as possible. But remembered or forgotten, the action will have its own honorable or dishonorable fulfillment. There is no way of escaping it. So finally, as the Zen points out, if you really want to know what the rules are, you can sit under a tree like Lao Tse did in China uh, on the plantation or on the estates of a great noble, So finally, as the Zen points out, if you really want to know what the rules are, you can sit under a tree like Lao Tse did in China uh, on the plantation or on the estates of a great noble and just watch. Watch the birds and the flowers and the sunshine. Watch the growing things. Watch the fruits and all the phases of nature. Watch the storms and what they do. You learn a great deal from storms because the storm frightens us. It seems at the moment to be a terrible thing. It is, is a worry and an anxiety. And then a few days later, the whole earth has received a baptism from that which seemed to us to be cruel or hard or harsh or dangerous. So everywhere in nature we have, as Lhotse found, the basis and traces of wisdom. And this is what was brought together in a kind of a mystical way by the Zen folks. Uh, Zen is a philosophy of very quiet self-control without effort. It is an effortless effort. It is something that is accomplished by the firmness of relaxation, by refusing to allow the mind to be agitated, to find that we can discipline, discipline the mind so that it can do what we want it to do and can be observant of the things we want it to observe and not constantly leading us from one misery to another. So the Zen people, very quietly, seek to remove from their lives the causes of difficulty on the grounds that, the, as in Buddhism, that the attainment of illumination is a personal responsibility, that the individual has to save himself in the last analysis. It sounds a little difficult, but it is also obviously honest that we should get over through our own efforts the things we got into by our own mistakes. So in Zen, everyone has to be his own teacher, his own guide, but he also has to live and be governed by a universal cosmotheism for which there can be no exceptions. 
Therefore, the duty of the mind is to study the symbols of the infinite as they are indicated in the finite. And by doing this, to gradually come to know the will of that which is invisible but inevitable. If the mind is capable of accepting honestly the testimonies of the various faculties, the various perceptions, if it is capable of coordinating them, out of that coordination will come the nearest thing that we have to the symbolic image of divinity. When everything has been reconciled and brought into harmony with universal law, the individual comes as close as anyone can come to the experience of the presence of God. Therefore, this presence of God becomes, in the Buddhist philosophy, the presence of a program, a plan, not a person. It is the realization of the principle of existence. It is the realization that everything that we see around us is a manifestation of one thing. A simple way of finding that is the way Luther Burbank found it. He looked around, he saw all kinds of flowers and plants. If you look at them first, you can say, well, they're all separate flowers and separate plants. They're different shapes, different colors. Some have beautiful aromas and others do not. So that these, this is a field full of flowers. But Burbank realized that this field full of flowers was simply the way his eyes, the way his mental faculties explored the field. He knew somewhere within himself that there was only one life behind all of these flowers. And if that life failed, they all died. Therefore, they were not separate as they appeared to be. They were merely expressions of one life energy moving inevitably in space and over the surface of the earth. He realized that the seed and the flower and the plant all were phases of one process of eternal unfoldment in nature. He realized that the great oak tree was hidden in the acorn. He realized that all great things emerge from sources that are invisible and everything that exists depends for existence upon one life. That the no creature has a life of itself. It's only a differentiation of a universal life. Each thing is part of all other things. Each person is part of humanity. And humanity as a whole is part of life in space and as far as we can imagine. Therefore, this one life is the thing that we are trying to understand as much as we can. And we can never see it in its nakedness because it is beyond any conception or projection that we can imagine. The only way we can find it is through this cosmotheistic approach in which suddenly we see creation as the body of the creating power. We suddenly see the universe as the eternal. And this eternal when we view it this way, we must recognize that it has every faculty, power, and attitude conceivable within itself. That there is no th part of existence that is beyond this eternal principle. And that this principle is utterly mathematical, utterly realistic, absolutely natural, because it is the creator of nature and manifests through it. When we begin to study these factors a little more clearly, we may gain a little strength to object to the false teachings of our own intellects. We may find that it is easier to believe in, a go in good if we begin to recognize that the principle of good is the life principle of everything that exists. And that actually the good is not only a condition, it is an inevitable and that which exists must ultimately become good, because nothing in nature is lost. So in this type of thing, the Zen man begins to reduce his wants, cultivate a universal quietude, meditate upon the realities of life, and gradually gain the realization of the tremendous power that is within himself. The power which he has 
never really used because he has permitted it to become the slave of his mind that if he wants to be a millionaire that's important and for that all other conditions must be sacrificed if he hates someone that hatred must be justified and fulfilled by injuring the person who is hated if the individual is antisocial he must tear down society if he is a, a fanatic in some religion he must persecute members of other faiths all these things are mental delusions they are all the direct result of the individual losing control of his own life and allowing it to pass into the complete control of his mental coordinator the coordinator can tell him that these armies have uh, righteous causes that the feud has lasted for ages the another type is where trying to find out where the land began who was the first on the land now if you can find that out it justifies kicking off anyone who's on it now all these things are schemes and plots and plans which could be solved without bloodshed or without sorrow by a simple kindness but uh, ambitions get in the way of kindness ambitions want for themselves kindness wants for the common good so we have to fight this problem most of us will not be confronted with the uh, blank necessity of uh, going out and uh, making a militant program out of all this but we can start as much as possible when we have a mood come on let's uh, stop for a minute and say where does this mood come from is this mood a fulfilling a secret desire of my own is it something i have to do simply because i have the mood to do it if i want to go out and say something unkind about another person do i have to do it well says the mind you might as well because it said this other person said something nasty about you once you have a perfect right to get to go out and answer it back so the individual well consigned and still feeling himself to be a good christian goes out and uh, says what he feels like saying and hurts someone else now, this is the way we do things we mean well we believe an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth we believe if somebody hits us hit him back all this type of thing is mind born it is part of ages of mental conditioning in which we from education onward we train the mind to a defensive offensive code of life we constantly show the mind what's wrong with everything we constantly prove to the mind that in some mysterious way we are better than anyone else and it goes on and on and through higher education and so finally when we graduate we not only have lost contact with reality but in many cases we have simply paralyzed the mind there's nothing left the mind is worn out tired out and ready to die by the time we're 22 years old it uh, the we are educated in all kinds of attitudes that we should never have had we are forced to assume certain ambitious careers that we were not fitted for and the whole thing in education today sums up to the concept of success the one dismal tragedy of life is not to be a success so in order to be a success in something we become a universal failure we lose all contact with values we try to live in a little world that in itself is passing we are trying to adjust to a generation the like of which has never been before and may never be again we do not have any way of transcending the pressure of an environment and yet within ourselves there is a power that is stronger than any environment that can ever exist because it is the power that is the true environment of life itself it is the thing that life wants done and we just haven't the courage or the insight to do it of course education in this field has been seriously neglected i think every uh, good school should have some kind of a course in it dealing with the contemplative philosophy with the contemplation of values uh, entirely apart from the daily processes of making a living 
something should be done to teach the individual something about his own inner life, about the values within him, and that he was not here simply to nurse a carcass. He was here to do something. He was here to release a genius, a power, a skill from within himself. Some may be more equipped than others due to reincarnation, but all in their own way are here to contribute to the common good and not simply to fight the danger of bankruptcy for themselves the rest of their lives. If we had some kind of a basic quietude, I think it would be a great help. In one of the Asiatic countries, Thailand, most young people go into the priesthood. When they graduate from school, many of them become temporarily Buddhist monks or nuns usually for a year or two. And during that period, they have graduated from school. Now they are there to discover and experience the tranquilities of the spirit. They live an ascetic life for that period of time. It's not permanent, but it's a part of a postgraduate course in being a human being. As a result of being uh, poverty, dominated, they have nothing. They can have nothing. The only thing they can accept is a little food in a bowl, and it must be given to them. But this gets through some of this arrogance. It gets through a lot of pretension. Also, these young people wandering along the countrysides as mendicants begin to discover people. They find out what other people think, how they live, what the, how they feel, and how their values rise. It's a very great and interesting experience, and it is something an equivalent to which would be very useful here that the individual graduating with skill from one of our, with our institutions would have a pilgrimage of a year of dedication or would be required to go out and practice his skill in some foreign field or some level of society where he will serve others without compensation. I think after that he might have an entirely different viewpoint on life. Most of those who have gone out in various ways in Peace Corps work and so forth have been considerably influenced by what they have seen and have come to realize more of the real problems of humanity, problems that we carefully conceal from ourselves and from each other. So the Buddhist attitude as the Zen man has this quietude in it, not to become rich or great, but to become better. And if there is a native talent, as ML may be, that this talent should be used for the common good of mankind. Out of this, the workman is worthy of his hire. But the concept of vast accumulations under the name of success must be left behind. The real success is the individual whose usefulness is great and who is able to contribute strongly to the well-being of others. One years ago, there was a little story told, it's kind of cute, in Buddhist temples in Japan, including the Zen temples, uh, there are very wide eaves and beautiful tiles and so forth, and these temple walls and ceilings on the outside, the roofs, become the proper places for birds together. And they come by thousands, and the old monks feed them and take good care of them, for the first veterinary hospitals in the world were managed by Buddhists. At the uh, if a tourist comes in and sees these birds up there, looks down around and says, my, those birds are nest- n- messy. They're messing up the whole place. And the old Buddhist monks say, well, they're not messy. They're not messy. They are, they are very, very lovely and beautiful. We take care of them. And if there's any mess, we know more than they do, so we clean it up. And this is more or less the attitude that you have among these people. And it's a good attitude. It's an attitude that shows that there is a level of society which is not self-centered. There is a, a part of human nature that will not be denied the experience of the presence of a divine power. In every society, atheistic, or uh, heathen, so-called, there are those that have no philosophy of religion. There are some who set themselves aside automatically for some type of charity, for some good work, 
for something to help other people. And these are the ones who come the nearest uh, to the good life and also are the ones most likely to be remembered in history. History does not record nearly as much uh, information about the materially successful as about those mentally, morally, spiritually, and ethically successful, those who have lived above the corruptions of their times. In our own little way, in our own daily living and so forth, we can begin to try, desperate, not desperately, but sincerely, uh, to carry on a, a better disciplined attitude toward life. We can discipline our entertainment programs and simply not attend things that we know are not good. We can discipline our reading to books that are inspiring and helpful and get out of the great international publication field of scandal and gossip. Uh, we can uh, get away from all kinds of infirmities of relationship. We can restore broken friendships. We can make new friends. We can try to be useful to people around us who are obviously in need. And little by little, we can find a life of harmlessness, a life which, in the long run, makes us no poorer than we would have been before but richer in memories of beauty and me memories of charity and love and friendship. These are the things that really count, because it is only the memory of what is done that we can take with us when we go. None of the things we have added up can we go. They all have to stay behind for another generation to pour over in one way or another. But that which is in the soul of us is a deeper memory. Behind the memory of the mind, there is a universal memory in all of us. And that universal memory is the continuity of the soul, which goes on from life to life, uh, helping us to grow. For all embodiments are merely days and nights of one life. And we are going to school one day, and then another day, and then another day. But the soul power itself is the long, vast computerization of everything that we have done since we existed as individuals. And little by little, this information becomes available to us, not by the perpetuation of incidents, but by pressures within ourselves, feelings, convictions, hopes, beliefs, uh, ideals, arise from some deeper source than from within our mental structure. The mind is only aware of this life, but the soul and the heart are part of our entire pattern of universal existence. That which we feel within ourselves as a great impulse to kindness, charity, thoughtfulness, and virtue, these are the testimonies to long experienced lessons. They have been ours for a long time and we will continue to build them. But always we must realize that the, uh, pri the primary purpose is that the individual shall simplify his life, that he shall gradually reach the point where he cannot continue to live entirely from the outside. There is a point in which the life tips from externals to internals. The individual who has very little enlightenment is completely under the pressure of the things around him and the persons who can influence him. As he gets wiser and wiser, the process is changed. Little bit by bit, the leadership comes from the inside and not from the opinions of other people. The principle in the heart and mind take strength, and the fallacies of our present physical systems become apparent. It's an amazing thing, it seems to me, that with science as far advanced as it is in many things, that it seems to remain completely unaware of anything not physical. It just cannot transcend the physical patterns of things. The scientist might like to view the universe as a vast computerizing mechanism, but he will not put any operator behind it. He will insist that the machine works itself and a computer working itself will soon disillusion anyone who tries it because it cannot be done. The great mystery in life is 
how these things can happen, how this infinite diversity of human relationships, the infinite diversity of stars, constellations, the vast distances of time and space, and the number of tiny little cells that are found in the stalk of a plant, everything perfect, everything exactly as it ought to be, everything showing the highest skill of creativity that is imaginable, everything obviously bearing witness to a supreme intelligence that never contradicts itself, that never goes against its own rules, but is forever trying to bring living things into harmony with life itself. How science can face this and not see anything is very difficult to understand. The reason has to be very simple. The mental coordinator has taken over. It has done it to the degree that the mind has become and is remaining the slayer of the real. There has to be something to break through this boundary, to get over this insistence that the mind is the highest power in man. It is not. There is much above the power of the mind, but the most immediately available is the power of the heart. Above that, the evidence of a soul long conditioned in existences. These things are the real basis of strength, the basis of securities. Some way in this turn, turn for something better, we must be I'll be able to remember the story in the um, uh, advertisements from Parnassus uh, by the Italian satirist Trajano Boccolini. The gods, seeing that men were in a terrible condition, decided to, admit, to elect a committee to go down and find out what was wrong and do something about it. So the committee of sages and scholars went down uh, to see what they could do about humanity. And all they had were ideas of one kind or another that some thought there should be a window put in the human chest so that everyone could read a person's heart and find out what he really felt. But this was a rather inconvenient and somewhat curious anatomically, so this was rejected. And so on it went and on and on until everything was rejected. And finally, uh, in order to have a report to give to the, to the waiting world, the committee elected a member to get up and say that they had made the great reform of all times. They had regulated the price of cabbage. <laughs> and this is what we do. And because of this very wise and naturally cer a certain uh, a thought, Boccolini was strangled in his bed. Because people didn't want to hear that. They wanted to hear that everything was just wonderful. In spite of the fact that nothing seems to be too wonderful at the moment. But in effort to solve problems, we go through everything you can think of that will not disturb our materialistic focus. We do not want to move from a com competitive to a cooperative basis in life. We want to have the, pr the problem, the possibility of being great successes, even though most of us have to remain less successful. On the hope that if one person can become wealthy, thousands refuse to accept a better way of life and thought. All this adds up to the very simple problem that the mind must be re-educated. It is a job that usually has to take place after the individual graduates from school because there's nothing in the schooling that's going to help him much to do it. The only thing a schooling can do is to give a certain uh, orderliness. It can make a person disciplined to learn certain things. From the discipline, perhaps, that he has gained in 12 or 15 years of education, the individual can begin to discipline himself, can begin to sense the need to clear up his own confusions. And if necessary, to make the thing as simple as possible, he can begin keeping records of his own conflicts and contradictions. He can write down his decision on a matter of a certain day and read it six months later and see whether his decision was really a good one. 
I know an individual who has been wrong in a number of details for over a period of years, but they have yet to admit that they ever made a mistake. And when the mistake hits them in the face, they have some evasion to turn it off so that it doesn't interfere with their personal estimation of infallibility. This is the way we all go. But out of this, we have to come, finally, to the realization that the inner life must lead the outer life and that our lives up to now have been largely on the basis of history and the basis of records of material activities. We are thinking of ourselves as the descendants of the Romans and the Greeks and all the ancient people. We read with considerable thoughtfulness the stories of their miseries, misfortunes, and tribulations. It may occasionally dawn on us that we are having the same difficulties. But that is where it ends. There is no real vitalization. But if a person can reach a period in, or condition in life in which he leads his own life and instead of following his mind, a great deal can be accomplished that is valuable and useful. The individual probably will have certain problems to face if he does it. He will find that growing is not easy and that correcting mistakes is not easy. But he will also have a gradually unfolding sense of accomplishment. He will begin to have a real sense of his own significance and value in the unfolding of world affairs. So it is very useful and necessary for each person to try for this contemplative type of living. And the Zen man does it in a very, very simple way. He is very quiet. He sits down and tries to clear the mind of all the foolishness that has accumulated there. He tries to get out of his mind the pressures of politics. He has to try to correct the constant statements of those around him that everything is wrong. He has to keep on quietly contemplating the universal pattern and his own place in it and gradually come to the realization that he is here to serve that he is here to be of value to his fellow men. And while he may have a deeper insight into some of these things, the services he renders will be perfectly recognizable by those about him. The individual who goes out and helps people in trouble may do it from an invisible cause within themselves, but the visible effect will be seen and known by those he serves. Therefore, there is a certain evidence of the intent and of the achievement. And wherever we find a truly noble example of human effort, we see that it is a symbol of an intent within the soul itself. What comes from the soul is beautiful in terms of the soul. It may not be the ultimate beauty we all long for, but it is a beautiful act in itself a masterpiece of mental and emotional achievement. And as we make these more and more frequently, we realize that the greatest of artists in all the world is not the painter or the sculptor, but the one who is able to internalize and manifest the great art of living itself. If we can only do these things, most of the problems that we solve will be a little better. But it's good to remember that the mind is not a leader. It is only a help in time of trouble. It is a kind of a Luciferian help also. It can get us into a lot of trouble. But if we are able to gradually convert the mind, if we can make the mind a convert of nobility, idealism, and integrity, then it can become a wonderful servant. It is a wonderful servant, but a horrible taskmaster. If we are run by the mind, we are run to destruction. But if we use the mind as an instrument, like the computer, because we have a personal consciousness regulating that machine, because it is a servant of a conscious power, then the mind is useful. But if we mistake this mind for that power, and are willing to allow ourselves to be constantly deceived by our own thinking, then it is not so good. 
So I think that uh, with our problems as they are, it would be a good plan for everyone who can to kind of think through this problem of trying to reform his own mind, to get his mind into a condition in which it can serve not only himself but his world, that it can make a lasting, enduring contribution to his family, to his friends, to those around him a contribution of integrities, of unselfishness, of dedication, and of honest, straight thinking. The most difficult and valuable of all senses is common sense. And common sense is actually the uh, machine of the six senses, coordinated. Common sense is what comes out when all that goes in is correct and is honorably recorded. Out of all the experiences of life, the final value lies in the fact that it strengthens the common sense which joins all human beings, the, the tremendous sensitiveness to the universal purpose and the plan to which we all belong. So if we work with these things a little bit, I think maybe we can become an operator of our own private computer and see that it doesn't bill wrong, go out of order every few minutes, and come up with some incredible conclusions because we don't use it properly. If we don't use the mind properly, it can get us into a lot of trouble. Use it well, and it can be an ever-present help. It's up to the individual to realize that he is the master of the mind, just as he is properly the ruler of his body. Well, I guess that's all for this morning.